Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Arun Thara VM, and I am a simulation product specialist with Go Engineer. Uh, thank you for joining me this morning for a webinar on SolidWorks Plastics and how we utilize SolidWorks Plastics for cooling line design. Um, before we get started, I want to get a couple of housekeeping items out of the way. The presentation link will be sent out to everybody at the end uh, and available for replay. Um, if you'd like to live tweet any quick tips that you pick up during the webinar, you can use uh, the hashtag GoEngineer uh, handle and also tag our Twitter handle at GoEngineer. Um, following the presentation, there'll be some time for questions, but during the presentation, you've all been uh, muted. Um, all right, let's get started. Again, uh, thanks for joining me this morning. Uh, so we're going to go the next couple of uh, minutes on uh, the injection molding validation tool that's integrated into a SOLIDWORKS CAD tool called SOLIDWORKS Plastics. I'm sure if you guys have joined me for the webinar, you have some background on what the tool does. Basically, it's a virtual way by which we can recreate the injection molding process. And as you all know, the injection molding process involves a whole bunch of parameters, everything from the machine setting to the type of uh, to the type of mold cavity and to the type of plastic part that you're attempting to design. There are a lot of little defects that can actually propagate right to how the part is being manufactured. Now, through this webinar, I'm attempting to replicate some of those defects and find out what the cause of those defects are, primarily involving part warpage and cooling line design. Like I said, as far as pl SOLIDWORKS plastics go, like most of our uh, uh, packages or add-on modules, it's it also comes in three levels. There's the standard level that gives you all the capabilities that evaluates uh, the efficacy of filling the mold cavity with the plastic. So it helps you study how long a path is going to take to fill or how long a mold cavity is going to take to fill given uh, you know melt temperatures and mold temperatures and a fill time. Also, uh, it helps you evaluate all the manufacturing and the aesthetics defects associated with the fill process. For instance, short shots is your injection mold even going to fill? Uh, where are the well lines, you know, areas of aesthetic and structural uh, uh, defects? And also, where are the uh, areas that are most likely to have, what are the areas on your plastic path that are most likely to have sink marks? Just basic areas that you uh, can expect in, during the fill part of the uh, injection molding process. Followed by the professional package that involves the fill stage and the pack process. So following the fill, the plastic needs to be packed to reduce uh, shrinkages and to reduce porosity and to ensure that you have, uh, you know, a, a, I guess you have, a, you have a strong part at the end of the injection molding process. But besides the pack stage, you are also able to simulate multiple cavities. You're able to balance your runner system through these multiple cavities. You're able to run insert over molding analyses where you have plastic parts over molded um, on, you know, other plastics or metals. And you're also able to simulate the co-injection process besides many of the other tools. Uh, now, the final tier, the premium tier, essentially gives you uh, what the plastic looks like when it's eject ejected from the mold, you know, what are the various shrinkages and uh, uh, warpage that the plastic can undergo when it's ejected from the mold. And it also allows you to analyze the mold from, uh, you know, the uh, temperature distribution level. So typically in the first two stages, we assume uniform temperature distribution on the mold but with the premium level, you're actually able to simulate the cooling lines, specify coolant types, uh, mold uh, material properties, and the flow rates of the coolants to study how non-uniform temperature distribution on the mold can influence part warpage. Now, this is primarily what we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation, starting with part warpage. So what is part warpage? So it's really simple. You design a part to look a certain way, and the injection molded part looks a certain other way. It doesn't conform to all the... Uh, uh, tolerances that you had prescribed prior to manufacturing the part. Now, what are some of the reasons that causes the, uh, you know, your injection, mold, injection molding process to warp your parts? Well, I've uh, there are many uh, aspects of the entire injection molding process, right from the process parameters to the type of part you're using. But I'm essentially trying to highlight six on this slide. So, starting off with the injection process itself. Now, the rate of injection has a direct effect on. Um, the internal stresses that are set up in your part. Uh, so you have too high of an injection rate. Uh, it can cause uh, shear stresses at the gear that can, that can kind of evolve into residual stresses just within the part. Or if uh, the injection rate is too low, it could actually cause the part to short shot. So you need to find a fine balance between injection pressures and the speed of injection while uh, you know designing your sprue and runner system. 
packing and cooling time, of course, you know, thicker parts tend to be held longer at lower pack pressures um, to avoid any uh, uh, to avoid the development of any uh, internal stresses. Um, but what the, a lot of designers find it difficult is to uh, you know find difficult to do is to find the ideal time to pack parts for different wall thicknesses to reduce these uh, internal residual stresses. You actually have the ability to set up your pack profiles at SolidWorks Plastic to kind of study how they, you know, what effect this has on your wall profile. And of course, cooling time as well. You check the part before it uh, cools down to a sufficient level, it's going to warp uh, due to the temperature dif differential it experiences. Finally, melt temperature. Of course, low melt temperatures can cause uh, um, high internal stresses on the, um, you know, in the parts. So that's another parameter that you can manipulate to study how uh, part warpage is, is influenced, uh, you know, by melt temperature. Um, gate location, of course, uh, you'd want uh, your injection location to be in such a way that the part always flows away from the gate. Um, there, is, there aren't any opportunities of jetting or backfilling because this could also set up little air pockets and well lines that could contribute to the entire shrinkage process. So you'd want to, you want to specify a gate that uniformly fills the part right from the gated point to, you know, the end of fill. Finally, part sizes. Now, this is this becomes a two-part problem. Now, cardinal rule of plastic part design is essentially you'd want uniform wall thicknesses. Anytime you have non-uniform wall thicknesses, you have uh, non-uniform shrinkage, and that could cause uh, your part ultimately to warp. Um, the second part being, uh, if the parts are too thin during the ejection process, uh, you know these thin areas or these thin, uh, yep, these thin locations have a tendency to uh, to deform when they're being ejected from the mold cavity. So those are a couple of things you look for. Now, finally, what we're going to delve into for the rest of the presentation is non-uniform cooling. So like I said, with uh, some of the basic packages, we assume uniform mold temperatures, but being ability to simulate non-uniform cooling of the mold gives you the, the influence of the mold itself on part warpage. So let's take a look at this in the next slide. Now. As far as influencing the non-uniform cooling or the cooling of the, of the mold or the temperature of the mold, there are little cooling jackets that are built into the mold itself. Uh, these cooling jackets have uh, water or other coolants that are flowing at specific rates that essentially help you uh, in two aspects. The first aspect is it helps you control the direction of the warp by uh, making sure you, you have enough cooling lines uh, to maintain the uniform temperature distribution in your mold. Now, for instance, in this little illustration, the warp direction tends to be towards where the mold cavity is hotter. So, you know, the first example, you have two little cooling lines on, on you know, I guess the A side and three cooling lines on the B side. The part tends to warp more towards the A side because it's uh, hotter. Now, a similar effect can be seen in the second example as well, where the inside of this little uh, uh, L is hotter than the outside and the part tends to warp towards it. So you can really control warp direction by ensuring that, you know, even if you have non-uniform thicknesses, you can position your, full, your, uh, your cooling lines in order to uh, ensure that the part cools uniformly. And finally, uh, time as well. More often than not, designers, are not only, designers and manufacturers are not only interested in um, how uh, how aesthetically and structurally your parts perform at the end of the injection molding process, but they also want to improve production throughput. So the more number of parts you can squeeze out the least amount of time, improves production throughput, and cooling lines can be huge contributors to how you know how, how soon you can inject these parts. Now, in order to kind of illustrate the effect of cooling lines, I've taken about two cases, starting off with a simple plastic sheet. Now, uh, you can see these two images the first image indicating the plastic sheet itself and the second image indicating the cooling lines that run through the mold uh, mold cavity that's utilized to you know to, to manufacture this plastic sheet now as far as the molding parameters go we've uh, selected a generic location for the gate which is uh, right here at the end of the part uh, like i said the material was a abs material that we pulled off of our plastics material database the melt temperature was about 230 degrees celsius and the mold was maintained at a uniform temperature of 50 Celsius. Uh, we packed it for about 14 seconds at 80% of the max injection pressure. And the size of the part is approximately 7 by 8 by you know, 1 fourth. Just to give you an idea of how big uh, the plastic sheet is. 
Now, um, running through the entire simulation process, we are able to uh, uh, inspect the part for aesthetic and structural defects. And since this is a warp and cool presentation, uh, I brought up the how the part warps towards the end of the uh, to, I mean, at the ejection stage. So you can see that um, there is almost non uh, the out of plane warp warping is almost non-existent, primarily due to the uniform temperature distribution assumption. But the part does sh shrink in the x and the z direction. So something that's expected of, uh, you know, a, a thin plastic sheet like this. Um, and the part isn't, uh, and the warp isn't very ex excessive either. I believe it's about 60 thousandths. Now, based on that part warpage, we kind of evaluated what, how different cooling line layouts influences the warp profile. So, from our previous discussion, uh, we, we could expect the part to essentially warp towards the hotter side of the mold. Now, uh, specifying the uniform cooling lines uh, throughout uh, in, in the mold would help you avoid this, you know, just kind of non-uniform warpage. So, uh, quickly running this analysis, setting up coolant. So, these, these lines essentially indicate the coolant directions. The coolant that was used was water that was injected at 10 degrees, and this was... Uh, uh, injected in the side of the sprue location because that's the location that you'd like to keep the coolest. Now this slide essentially gives you the result. It compares and contrasts the mold temperatures that we were seeing for the non-uniform cooling layout versus the uniform cooling layout. So just to give you an idea, we were able to take cross sections uh, at the at the post-processing stage, at the result stage, and study the temperature distribution at these cross sections. Now, you can see that in the uniform cooling stage, you have, well, a uniform temperature distribution um, right across the mold uh, in the, uh, I guess, in the X and in the XY and the YZ planes. Another important thing to note is that the temperature at the end of the cooling process is about 17 degrees. Now, as far as the non-uniform cooling case goes, you can see that the mold temperature is about 75 degrees towards the bottom half of the mold. Uh, yep, of course, uh, uh, this, this would obviously have a direct effect on how, f how, mo how long it takes for these parts to cool. For instance, this part took about 120 seconds to cool, while uh, this part took about 158 seconds to cool, given the layouts that they have. Now, as far as the warp comparisons go, I mean, this, this kind of resonates with what we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, you know, you expect the part to warp towards the hotter side. We have a, a drastic out-of-plane warping in the non-uniform cooling layout, but in the uniform cooling layout, much like our uniform temperature distribution assumption, you have a lot of in-plane shrinkage. Um, not very significant, matter of fact, much lower than the uniform temperature distribution assumption, but you have almost non-existent out-of-plane shrinkage or warpage. Now let's kind of take some of these techniques and you know utilize some of these that we know on say a, a real part design. Now what you're looking at here is a valve grip. You might have seen this grip on many of our other SolidWorks presentations right from part creation to structural strength analysis. What I decided to do was to analyze this part for part warpage and try out different cooling line profiles uh, and look at their influence on how the part warps during the ejection stage. Now, as far as the material parameters go, uh, it's, uh, it's a generic uh, high-density polyethylene material with a melt temp of 210 degrees, mold temp of 40, 40 degrees Celsius. It was packed for about four seconds at 80% of the maximum injection pressure. And finally, the volume of the part, just to give you an idea of the size, is about 9 cc's. Now, what I'm going to attempt to do is kind of jump into SolidWorks to show you how I can translate all these parameters into a SolidWorks plastics tool and what kind of results we can actually derive from the injection molding process. Now, before I jump in, I just want to show you a couple of preliminary results. Uh, so the max cooling time is about 35 seconds. Now, uh, you can see the surface cools the fastest to about, between about one to eight seconds. Now, uh, studying the cooling time at the cross sections indicate these large wall thicknesses that actually take the longest to cool. And this also has a direct effect on the deformation shape. Now, you can see this kind of, uh, you know, rotational warp. That's warping essentially to the hotter side of the uh, of the part. 
so you have uh, a, su a substantial amount of in-plane shrinkage and a, a substantial amount of y-direction shrinkage. So in the next couple of stages, I'm going to attempt to kind of draw out a cooling line profile to kind of see how that cooling profile kind of influences the swap shape. Now our ultimate goal would be twofold to reduce the amount of time the part takes to cool and to minimize the warp shape. Now as far as the cooling line layout that was selected for this process goes, uh, again uh, the layout indicated by these little tubes, the flow rate was about 150 cc's per second and the inlet temperature was 15 degrees celsius. Again keeping keeping the uh, I guess standard of, of uh, starting the cooling lines at the location of this, uh, uh, I mean towards the injection location, uh, the, this blue line essentially indicates the direction of the coolant flow. And they were essentially crowded at this location primarily because these areas took the longest to cool, as evidenced by the previous slide that showed you the part cross sections with the cooling times. Well, that's my cue to jump into solid wax. Great. Now, within solid wax, I'm sure you've uh, uh, you've utilized solid wax long enough to understand how the layout works. You have a little command manager that, that gives you all the features to set up the product. You have this little feature manager that populates a history of all the items that you use to kind of create uh, the part. Well, our uh, validation tools work the same way. Now, if you jumped into the SolidWorks add-ins tab, you have all the simulation tools that help you validate uh, the part for you know structural strength and manufacturing manufacturability virtually. Now, um, to add in the SolidWorks plastics tab, uh, the, the plastics tool, all I need to do is click a button, and a couple of things happen. Now the command manager updates to have the SolidWorks plastics button that gives me all the tools to set up the analysis and also I have a SolidWorks feature, a plastics feature manager tree that helps me manage all the analysis parameters. Now you'll notice the analysis tree is pretty empty so uh, what I need before I start up this process is to actually mesh the model uh, to kind of translate the solid model to the solver and the meshing process is pretty straightforward. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate my sketches just to indicate to you uh, what the cooling lines look at, look like. So in order to draw the draw and mesh the cooling lines or simulate the cooling lines, all I need are a couple of sketches representing the coolant cooling circuits. I I don't need the physical cooling lines themselves. Now for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to walk you through the meshing process. Now there is a an auto meshing process that automatically meshes the solid part itself, but if cooling lines and runner systems are involved, it's recommended that you go the manual route. So the manual route, uh, you'll only need to indicate a couple of parameters right from uh, just uh, indicating to the software that you are going to use a virtual mold and you are going to uh, use a, a cool, cooling system. Uh, yeah, you, you are going to use a cooling system in order to study the non-uniform temperature distribution of the mold. So checking both those options and hitting next leads you to another menu. Now this menu is a cooling channel design wizard. All you need to do is select all the sketches that represent the cooling lines. In this case I have about three sketches. I'm going to specify the diameter of cooling channels and I'm going to specify the number of elements I'm going to associate with the uh, cooling analysis process. Now as soon as I finish the assignment, you can see that it's actually picked up some stray sketch lines that I've used as uh, references. I can very easily go in and delete those uh, uh, you know, reference lines that don't belong to the cooling profile or the cooling circuit. Great, now once I have the cooling, uh, cooling lines propagated or cooling lines generated, now all I need to do is hit next and go about the virtual mold creation process. Now I can either specify the virtual mold by uh, selecting the boundaries of the planes in the different directions or I can simply specify the size with the, uh, relative to the or origin. So I'm going to set some standard sizes here. I'm going to set the x, uh, the x direction size to about 125, the y direction to about 80, and the z direction to about 50. You typically alter these based on the actual mold size that you're utilizing for uh, the, you know, the physical injection process. Now once you specify the size of the mold, you hit the add button and you move on. Now the next stage essentially indicates to you that there are three domains that are cooling channels. There's the part cavity and there's the mold that is going to need the meshing. 
Now I'm going to hit next and I'm going to uh, specify a size for the mesh. Now keeping the standard size you'll notice that the part's a little rough of course meshing directly has uh, has a role in how accurate your analysis is especially you'd like a large degree of refinement around the gate locations. Now SOLIDWORKS Plastics lets you do that through making localized refinements. So I'm able to specify the size uh, of the triangles I want to associate. Let's see. Let me try that again. Yep. The size of the triangles I want to associate with these really small features to ensure that my virtual injection molding process is as accurate as possible. Is 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 accurate. Now, as soon as I assign a smaller triangle size to those little uh, surfaces. I'm going to hit the green check mark. I'm going to reduce the overall size of the mold, I mean of the cavity as well. And I'm going to hit the mesh bar. So you can kind of see the non uniform uh, uh, mesh distribution, the non uniform mesh densities. Now, once I have that, I need to associate a, a specific size to the mold because everything that needs to be analyzed needs to be meshed. Now, how the meshing process works is it start, starts off by creating the surface mesh. So the surface mesh has been created for all three parts. Now, all I need to do is specify a type of solid mesh. I'm going to stick to the tetrahedral type for both the mold cavity and uh, the mold and the cooling line. I'm going to use some of the default settings. And you can quickly see that on using some of the default settings uh, you can look at the element distribution to kind of uh, have a quick sanity check on how uniform the mesh is if you have these nice square elements close to the surface uh, to improve the boundary layer performance and so on and so forth I'm going to turn off the sketches here great now we've successfully solid meshed uh, our uh, mold, the mold cavity, and the uh, cooling lines. Now as soon as the mesh is created, now all we need to do is go down the tree and assign material properties, process parameters, and boundary conditions. Starting off the material properties, SOLIDWORKS Plastics Boss, a material database that uh, has more than 4000 materials. Now I'm going to use a generic HD, HDPE material, so I'm going to hit the search tab, search for HDPE, let me try that again. There it is. You have all the properties that are completely customizable. Now once I have the polymer assigned, I have a database of coolants that I can use as well. Now I'm going to use water as a coolant. And finally for the mold material, I'm just going to use a 420 uh, SS can see all the heat capacities and thermal conductivities uh, populated. Okay, now once I have uh, the material properties assigned for the polymer coolant and the mold, all I need to do is specify the process parameters for the injection molding process. Now I'm going to head into the fill settings. Now these settings are typically populated based on you know the, the material you're utilizing and the volume of the part. Now the predicted fill time is about 1.43 seconds. The max fill pressure of 100 megapascals would be utilized. So at the end of the injection molding process, this is a result. Finally, I'm going to keep the melt and the mold temperatures as default. Now, once I have the fill profiles assigned, I'm going to head into the pack setting. Now, this is where you can really uh, influence part warpage is how this pack profile plays out during your injection molding process. Now, my pressure holding time is, is set at 4.3 seconds and the cooling hold time is set to about 9 seconds. And this is essentially the profile that takes you through what injection pressure will be applied during this entire process. Okay, great. Now my warp setting is relatively straightforward. All I need to specify is the ambient temperature of the path that experiences when it's exposed to the outside. Finally, now the cool settings is where I specify, again, the air temperature, the, the temperature that the uh, the minimum coolant temperature, the average coolant flow rate, and the mold open type that open time that that features in the final cycle time calculation of the entire injection molding process. You can also specify control parameters on when the part is ejected and when the warp calculations begin, with respect to either specifying a cooling time 
or by specifying the eject, temp eject temperature so the cooling time is calculated based on the ejection temperature so when 90 percent of the part cools part volume cools to 110 degrees that's when the ejection process begins okay great now once i have the materials and the process parameters set up and you'll notice most of them were defaults now the only things i need to specify are the injection locations and the direction of the coolant flow so i can do this through the cool pipe settings now the cool pipe settings essentially populates the direction of the coolant flow and the temp inlet temperatures now i'm able to specify each coolant circuit and reverse the direction of the flow and also specify an inlet temperature so you can see that there's one circuit that i've assigned about 15 degrees and the other circuits to about 30 degrees and finally once i have the coolant uh, You'll notice that once these conditions are applied, you'll, uh, there's a little green check mark that gives you a quick sanity check on whether an item has been assigned. Finally, uh, the injection locations. Now, the injection locations can be a little uh, tricky in the sense that you'd want to ensure all the nodes on the face of the gate is captured. So you can use this little pointer to ensure that. Now, you create a pointer that's slightly larger than the size of the, uh, you know, size of the physical gate. Now, if you don't capture all the elements that contribute to the injection you can always switch to injection phase and add all those elements manually now of course we support multiple injection locations uh, even in the base packages so I'm going to add another injection location right here I'm going to increase the size of the pointer so that I'm able to capture Again, these pointer sizes have nothing to do with the gate sizes. It depends on the number of elements you've captured during the setup process. Okay, great. Now that all of these boundary conditions and the process parameters and the materials have been set up, now all you need to do is hit uh, run on any one of these processes based on which stage of the injection molding process you'd like to begin. Typically, you run the cool analysis. The flow analysis then interpolates these cool results to uh, study or utilizes the cool results to study the part flow based on you know visco uh, temperature dependent viscosity and finally uh, on how how these flow parameters and pack parameters influence part warpage now i'm going to jump to an analysis that i've already run now uh, since i've already run the, the analysis process you can see the flow pack cool and warp results populated under the results item now i can activate uh, any one of these results by just right-clicking the result and hitting read. Now reading these flow results gives me insights into a couple of things. Um, what's the fill time? About 1.39 seconds. I'm able to animate the fill to kind of study how uniformly the part fills. I can also look at some results such as ease of fill to look at the, I'm sorry, the gate filling contribution to look at the contribution of both the gate locations on the fill process. You can see that both gates have equal contribution uh, but the results are, and the injection pressure also now 100 megapascals was the limit of the machine but 12 megapascals was utilized for the injection injection process but what I'm really interested in are the cool and the warp results so jumping to the cool results quickly gives me a couple of uh, items that I, can, that I can use as inferences to the uh, to the injection molding process now, with this cooling line layout, I'd like to see how long the part takes to cool. So initially, the part took, I believe, about 35 seconds to cool. We managed to shave that, shave a couple of seconds off of that. But what's the real holdup? What is this? Uh, what is this cooling line profile not addressing? By selecting clipping planes, you can quickly see that that's the same area uh, that is not being addressed uh, thanks to the cooling lines. Now, besides uh, taking a look at non-uniform part cooling we can also take a look at what uh, the mold temperature is at the end of the cool process so it says the maximum mold temperature of 47 degrees to really look at where most of the uh, where, where most of the most of the heat is we're able to utilize these uh, clipping plates kind of study the mold temperature so you can see that 
although the outside of the part cool, out, the outside surface of the mold could uh, uh, reach a temperature of about 21 degrees the inside closer to the core is at about 47 degrees which is definitely going to cause some non-uniform warpage towards the hot side now besides the mold temperature results I'm going to jump to the warp results to see what the part looks like at the end of the warp process and there it is as expected the part warps towards I mean in the y direction you know, towards the hotter side of the mold so what I attempted to do to overcome this and to see how much of an influence the mold temperature variation has on the part warpage itself um, I added another cooling circuit that goes through the core just to show you what that cooling circuit looks like and there it is so that's the additional line that I added to kind of keep the mold temperatures low now I'm going to jump back into the presentation to kind of show you the differences between this and the initial cooling layout well the setup was ideally the same you know similar mold temperatures melt temperature it was just the added cooling line that I want to see how uh, its effect on uh, part warpage so between the two cooling line profiles you can see that a max mold temperature of about 47 degrees was seen without the cooling circuit through the core but with the cooling circuit to the core the max temperature was reduced to about 33 degrees and it was at a area where the thickness of the part wasn't too too high but this could still influence part warpage I mean the temperature distribution here is about could be about six degrees it may not be too much of an effect uh, but we'll soon find out and you can see that adding the adding the cooling lines has sort of improved the cool times in these regions it's reduced the cooling time in the first circuit to about 33 seconds from 35 seconds but in layout 2 we have a 5 second uh, cool time save uh, through this process but it's still not quite there you still have a large temperature differential between these thick sections and the thin areas on the little valve grip finally as far as the warp goes between the initial design and the final design there are a couple of things uh, the, the warpage rates are similar but I believe that with the new layout the uh, in-plane warpage is reduced but the out-of-plane the Y warpage has uh, has remained the same so the inference from this entire process is we managed to reduce the time to cool from 35 to 30 seconds by adding cooling lines but uh, we haven't significantly been able to uh, to improve the warp performance of the part so what I went ahead and did was I improved the design so based on structural calculations to ensure that this doesn't the part doesn't fail on making these modifications we proposed another design that actually cores out uh, this little valve grip even further at two locations as indicated by these little red markers now we ran the entire process the fill pack and warp process again with the solid earth plastics to kind of study the influences of the of the design changes and you can see these influences are pretty are pretty significant now the out of plane the z direction warping is sufficiently reduced between the initial and the final design and also uh, we reduce the time to cool from about 35 seconds to about 14 seconds well that's about it again uh, the, the goal of this presentation was just to address the different factors that influence part warpage and how we can simulate those effects with solid box plastics. We took a look at how cooling lines have a direct effect on both the shrinkage factors in the part and how long the part takes to cool. Uh, we also looked at how we go through the uh, how we go through setting up a virtual injection molding simulation with solid box plastics and some of the CAD integration. You know, some of the CAD integration. Uh, in terms of similar UI between the CAD and the uh, simulation tool while uh, you know while trying to improve the warp performance of our designs. Again thank you so much for joining me have a great day. Mm -hmm.